Quand je parlais à ma, à ma journaliste préférée, hey, pour hey, 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 c'est la seule qui m'aime. Ah oui, ah, ok. Est-ce que vous êtes ouvert? Puis est-ce qu'il peut y avoir compensation vu que c'est un régime et non nécessairement un programme? Est-ce qu'il y a moyen de faire ça? Bien, il y a deux choses là-dessus. C'est qu'il y a court terme et long terme. La première chose à court terme, c'est qu'il existe déjà au Québec pour certaines personnes, certaines populations, des, euh, une couverture partielle de soins dentaires. Alors, c'est sûr qu'à court terme, on va devoir, et on le fait déjà, travailler ensemble pour partager l'information, s'assurer qu'il y a un arrimage le, le, le plus intelligent possible entre, les, entre ce que le gouvernement canadien va faire et veut faire et ce qui existe déjà au Québec. Et à plus long terme, il pourrait y avoir des, des, des discussions euh, comme ça se fait toujours dans le cadre de ces programmes-là, pour voir si des provinces, dont le Québec, aimeraient assumer une plus grande part de responsabilité, un leadership plus présent dans la livraison de ces soins dentaires Donc, pour les Québécois. Donc, vous êtes à leur permettre euh, de se retirer du régime et d'avoir une pleine compensation. Donc, ce qu'on dit, c'est qu'on est ouvert, on l'a toujours exprimé dans les derniers mois, à une discussion à la fois de court terme, qui est absolument essentielle, parce que les choses vont aller assez rapidement dans la prochaine année, et à plus long terme aussi, pour euh, mieux travailler ensemble, pour que les Canadiens et les Québécois soient mieux servis. Mais ce serait conditionnel j'imagine, donne une assurance dentaire à tout le monde. Oui, c'est sûr que ça. Parce qu'il y en a qui disent qu'ils pourraient avoir compensation qui compensaient euh, le manque à gagner dans le transfert en santé. Euh, Est-ce est que la compensation est conditionnelle? Est-ce que ça aille aux soins dentaires? Oui, c'est tout à fait ça. Des, ce sont des soins dentaires qui sont essentiels autant pour les Québécois que pour les autres Canadiens. C'est là pour servir les besoins du coût dentaire de tous les Canadiens, les jeunes Québécois, les enfants qui que les dentistes voient arriver dans leur, dans leur bureau avec des, une absence de prévention qui mène à des problèmes évidemment sérieux pour leur développement de court terme et de long terme. On veut que les Québécois aient autant que les autres Canadiens la chance de... Well, there are three parts to that. The first one is that, uh, as you know, since uh, last December, uh, children uh, uh, less than 12 years old have access to a dental benefit. Uh, I, in fact, invite, again, families to apply for that benefit. It's, uh, it's almost a quarter of a million uh, children now that have received this benefit, but there's a lot more that will uh, should be receiving this uh, essential dental benefit. The second piece is that uh, by the end of 2023, the, uh, all children, all seniors and people with disabilities will be receiving uh, the new dental uh, care uh, benefit. There will be a program in place by the end of 2023 because these three groups, uh, which are part of our agreement with the NDP, are uh, in or covered by the new dental plan. And by 2025, all families with an income below $90,000 will be eligible to the dental plan. Why $7 million more? Why $7 million more? Why $7 million more? Oh, uh, I ben non. L'idée de Qu'est-ce qui vous donne confiance que ça ben, va effectivement Les gens bien. qui m'écrivent depuis hier, c'est ça qui me donne confiance. Les manufacturiers m'appellent déjà en me disant qu'ils ont vu que la réponse du Canada. Vous avez aussi le président des manufacturiers canadiens qui a dit que c'est une réponse forte pour s'assurer qu'on obtient des investissements au Canada. Déjà qu'on est sur une bonne lancée. Vous savez, l'idée derrière ça, dans, dans le budget, c'est trois choses. On est là pour les gens dans leur vie personnelle au niveau du coût d'épicerie parce qu'on sait que c'est ça qui préoccupe les gens la santé, mais aussi l'économie de l'avenir, les emplois de l'avenir. Alors moi, je vous dirais, au contraire, écoutez, depuis ce matin, mon téléphone euh, arrête pas de, de sonner en disant, écoutez, on a vu ce qui est dans le budget, on est conscient de ce que le Canada veut faire. Et l'idée, c'est pas qu'on qu qu réponde nécessairement aux États-Unis, mais c'est surtout, ce que vous avez vu aux États-Unis, c'est les États-Unis qui nous rattrapent d'une certaine façon. Alors, si on veut rester dans le peloton de fil, il faut faire ces investissements-là, parce que, moi, je dis souvent, il y a un coût à l'inaction, parce que des, des opportunités générationnelles comme ça, ça arrive une fois dans une vie. Hein? Vous et moi, on a conduit un véhicule à essence, là, on s'en va vers le véhicule électrique, les batteries, ça arrive une fois dans une vie. Alors, je pense que les gens qui ont vu ça, moi, j'étais même, je vous dirais, agréablement surpris de la réponse. La réponse, elle est forte des manufacturiers qui me disent, écoutez, là, on voit que le Canada est très sérieux dans sa réponse. 
et, et ça va nous permettre de continuer à tirer des investissements. Sur le crédit d'impôt de 15 pour la production d'électricité, mm -hmm. ce qu'on lit dans le budget, c'est qu'il faudra que cette, euh, cette économie soit refilée aux consommateurs par des baisses de factures. Mm -hmm. Alors, je m'interroge, dans quelle mesure ça va vraiment être un incitatif à en faire plus de l'électricité si on gagne bien en Bien, je pense que, vous l'avez vu récemment, vous savez, au Québec, il y a eu beaucoup de discussions sur euh, les blocs d'électricité disponibles pour attirer des investissements. Moi, je pense que, particulièrement au Québec, mais c'est vrai dans d'autres provinces aussi, on est en train de réaliser que là, on doit vraiment augmenter la production, la distribution et la transmission d'énergie au pays. Et si on veut continuer à être... Vous savez, il y a toujours cinq facteurs qui permettent d'attirer des investissements. C'est les talents, les écosystèmes, les minéraux critiques, l'énergie verte, évidemment, l'accès au marché. Mais toute la question de l'énergie est au cœur de, du fait que le Canada peut attirer des investissements. Alors, ce crédit-là va permettre certainement, euh, j'en discutais même ce matin à la radio, euh, qui va être disponible même aux sociétés d'État. On parlait d'Hydro-Québec, par exemple, au Québec. Moi, je pense qu'avec toute cette question-là qui revient dans l'esprit des Québécois, des Québécoises, entre autres, de dire, mais là, on est un, un, une croisée des chemins, on doit augmenter notre production d'énergie. Oui, mais la question, qu c'est si vous exigez que ce, cette économie sous forme de crédit d'impôt soit refilée aux consommateurs, le producteur, il, il gagne rien, lui. Alors, pourquoi c'est un ben, je vous dirais d'abord parce que euh, ce qu'on a besoin, c'est d'augmenter la génération d'énergie, mais en même temps, c'est sûr qu'on veut qu'une partie de ces investissements-là revienne aux consommateurs et consommatrices, mais je pense que tout incitatif fiscal comme celui-là, puis on a vu l'exemple, si vous regardez aux États-Unis, ça amène des investissements. Alors moi, je suis confiant que euh, cette question-là de l'électricité va revenir beaucoup dans les prochaines semaines. J'aimerais vous poser une question sur l'intelligence. Listen, we're working hard. It's a very complex, uh, difficult issue uh, because uh, we believe in the in the technology, but at the same time, uh, to find someone who can take that business, continue the R and D, and, and make sure that we preserve what we have. What is my main concern is around the IP. That's what we want to keep in Canada because uh, we know that a, a plant-based vaccines could be the solution next time. If you ask me, is it easy? No. Uh, are we working hard? Yes. Are we going to find a solution? I'm, I'm confident we'll get there, and uh, but it's difficult because uh, we've been talking to a number of manufacturers. But you know, we owe it to the workers and to to make sure that we Nobody's continue. Nobody's stepping up. There's a number. There, there's a number of people who who are looking at. But like I say, it's a it's a complex issue. But we are putting all the pressure we can uh, on Mitsubishi to make sure that we find. A, a, a solution that would preserve the IP in Canada, because that's what I want to keep, and as many jobs as possible. What's the vision there for, and what's going to be brought forward eventually? Sorry, I missed the... Oh, on the uh, right for fair legislation. Yes. What's the vision there, and what do you expect to bring that forward? Well, as soon as possible. Uh, it's about time. I think Canadians have wanted that for a long time, uh, that, that, you know, in our appliances, in different uh, equipment we have, that for me, it's, it's just common sense that we, you would have the right to repair. So was happy to see that on the budget, and certainly we're going to move uh, forward. Intelligence quickly. artificielle, il y a oui. des experts qui demandent au gouvernement d'intervenir, d'imposer oui. un moratoire sur l'intelligence artificielle, ou peut-être de, de mettre certaines balises. Est-ce que vous considérez Tout légiférer, mettre des balises, ben, et à quelle échéance? C27, ce qui bloque, c'est l'opposition. C27, protéger les enfants en ligne. Tout le monde est d'accord. Je ne comprends pas que les conservateurs ne sont pas d'accord avec ça. Est-ce qu'il y a un parent... Non, mais l'intelligence artificielle, ben, quand on parle plus de technologie... Ben, oui, euh... mais C27 a tout un chapitre sur l'encadrement de l'intelligence artificielle. Donc, ce qu'on voit ce matin, moi, je suis content de voir ça. Ça devait être, euh, euh, j'espère, c'est comme on dit, euh, euh, un réveil pour l'opposition de dire arrêtez de bloquer C27. Dans C27, on a tout un chapitre. On sera le premier pays au monde avec l'Union européenne à encadrer l'intelligence artificielle. Alors, c'est le temps d'agir, c'est le temps de protéger nos enfants en ligne. C'est ce que je leur dis depuis le début. C'est 27 ans. Ben, non, mais ça l'encadre. Si vous regardez, l'Union européenne a même salué ce que le Canada fait. On est en avant de tout le monde. On est en avant de tout le monde. Moi, j'ai parlé à la commissaire européenne. Elle me dit même, Monsieur le ministre, avancez, nous, on va suivre. Alors, on est en avant. Si on peut adopter le projet de C27, la, la charte du numérique, tout le chapitre sur... Euh, euh, ce qu'on appelle l'intelligence artificielle. Ça va encadrer ça parce qu'aujourd'hui, ce qui manque, c'est un cadre. Il faut se donner un cadre. Alors, moi, je suis tout à fait d'accord. C'est pour ça qu'on l'a proposé. Mais là, il faut que le monde avance parce que les gens sont tannés d'attendre. Et là, je le dis à l'opposition, avançons sur C27. Les gens ont besoin d'un cadre. Mais est-ce que ça peut ratisser plus, que peut ratisser plus large ben, je pense, autre technologie? Ben, je pense que ça va donner le ton à l'international. Les gens 
veulent voir le Canada. Vous savez, on a fondé euh, euh, cette alliance-là avec les Français sur l'intelligence artificielle pour l'encadrer. Là, ce que les gens nous disent, c'est qu'on doit, euh, doit agir certainement là-dedans. Est-ce que vous êtes ouvert à amender au besoin? Moi, je suis ouvert à tout. Moi, ce que je veux, c'est qu'on puisse protéger les enfants au Canada et la Charte du numérique, c'est ce qu'ils veulent faire, puis encadrer l'intelligence artificielle. Merci tout le monde. J'ai besoin de dire. I'll be late. I'll be late. I need to keep my job. Oh, yeah, that's a problem. Moi, je vous dirais qu'il faut regarder qu'il y a un plan d'action qui a été financé hier. Je pense que c'est des très bonnes nouvelles pour les communautés de langues officielles. Le travail qu'ils ont fait pour se rendre à là euh, est vraiment quelque chose de, de remarquable. Alors, je pense que c'est des très bonnes nouvelles. Puis les organismes aussi ont été reconnus. Les 15 Donc, milliards, les 15 milliards en économie dans la gouvernementale inquiètent beaucoup la, la FPC, par exemple, préoccupe le PFPC aussi. Qu'est-ce que vous leur dites pour les rassurer? Est-ce qu'il y, y a des possibilités de compression de job dans l'appareil gouvernemental? À ce moment-ci, on sait qu'il y a eu beaucoup d'investissements qui ont été faits, entre autres, pendant la COVID. On revient à des investissements pré-COVID, donc on va faire, on va trouver des mesures pour... Euh, euh, réduire certains budgets qu'on n'a pas besoin à ce moment-ci. Moi, je veux rassurer euh, les euh, syndicats, entre autres, que nous allons travailler ensemble. On a vu qu'il y a beaucoup au niveau des services professionnels qu'on va pouvoir euh, trouver des économies. Puis, on va faire des économies aussi, tant au niveau des opérations que les, euh, les euh, contributions. Mais qu'est-ce que vous envisagez comme, comme option pour retrancher ce, ce 15 milliards-là? Est-ce qu'on parle d'attrition, comme on l'a vu dans le passé, de coupure de poste carrément? Est-ce que vous pouvez couper ailleurs? Qu est qui est sur Mais la je pense table? que la première nouvelle, c'est qu'on démontre qu'on est un gouvernement prudent. On va retourner à des euh, dépenses qui sont pré-pandémiques parce qu'on a fait beaucoup d'investissements pour soutenir les programmes, les services pendant la pandémie. Puis je vais avoir un plan d'action. Là, j'ai eu la nouvelle hier. Donc, vous savez qu'on va regarder différentes mesures et on va travailler évidemment. Et ça sonne comme des coupures de poste ou de contrat. Vous dites... Euh, euh, on revient après pandémie. Donc, Mais il y a beaucoup on, de programmes qu'on qu a beaucoup touché pendant la pandémie. Je pense qu'il faut qu'on regarde que certains programmes qui ne seront plus livrés. Donc, on va pouvoir s'assurer que ces programmes-là, euh, évidemment, ne fonctionneront plus. On a fait entre autres euh, les, les gros, j'appelle là, comme euh, la subvention salariale. Donc, ça, c'est des programmes qui ne seront plus. Donc, on va regarder à travers l'appareil gouvernemental comment on va pouvoir faire des économies. Can you explain to me how there's going to be a 3% reduction across all departments without a reduction in service or staff? How is that going to work? Well, as I was saying and also sharing with the Ottawa Business uh, uh, Trade uh, this morning, that uh, we are going to be uh, looking at how, because we're going back to pre-pandemic delivery of services, how we are going to find those economies in uh, our But do you have contracts. an idea right now? I will have a plan uh, very soon. I got the mandate uh, yesterday. Thank you. Well, a couple of things on that. First, the first estimate which was used was a, an estimate of the parliamentary budget officer in 2021. The officer obviously used the information that he had, which was quite limited at that time. The second thing, he revised those estimates in 2022, pointing to the fact that not according to the new information that he had, it would cost more. And the third thing is that in the last year, obviously, we've been working with experts and, 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 and leaders in the field, many of them knowing really well what's happening on the ground. And we've also learned recently that the take-up for the benefit, the dental benefit, has been very high, which means that there is a significant level of needs in, uh, in Canadians. Uh, uh, access to uh, dental care. There's so that's why those estimates are different now than what they were in 2021. But there's kind of a credibility problem with your answer because the NDP's own platform estimated the cost of $11 billion. You guys accepted their program as part of your supply and confidence deal, and then you decided that in the budget last year you downplayed the numbers to $6 billion. So isn't that the reason? Isn't that you're just now fully accounting for a program that we already knew the cost of in the 2021 election? 
Well, what we can now do, which others, including the NDP, couldn't do uh, just a year or two ago, is what we can do is to use the information that we now have, a lot more information gathered over the last year by experts and leaders in, in, in oral uh, health care. So that's why we believe our estimates are both better and more reliable in terms of the way forward. They're almost forward. exactly on par with the NDP platform. The difference is your budget from last year that lowballed them. Yeah, well, again, you know, we would all have wanted to have perfect estimates a year or two ago. Uh, that would have been uh, harsh to do given that there was lots of information which we did not have at the time. So now we have that information. I'm very grateful for those, to those that have provided that information, and we're going to use that information to keep updating uh, the uh, estimates for the the, the plan. Now, again, the key thing is to make sure that this plan is targeted to the needs of Canadians. There will be probably up to 9 million Canadians that will benefit from the dental plan. That's a large number of people, but more importantly, it's a large number of needs that need to be looked at. So when will it be available this year? When will it be available this year? Il y a eu effectivement la confusion. Madame Freeland euh, l'a corrigé en bonne partie hier. Et là, je, la, je, je, je pense là, que la confusion devrait être totalement euh, disparue. C'est-à-dire qu'on s'est engagé à mettre en place pour 2023 une, 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 un plan dentaire pour tous les enfants de 0 à 18 ans, pour les aînés et pour les personnes qui vivent avec des handicaps. Et pour ceux qui, euh, qui ne sont pas couverts par cette, ces populations, ce sera en 2023. Eligibility will be enhanced to all children, seniors, and people with disabilities. That, how that is going to happen concretely is still you know, the, 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 the focus of our work with all sorts of experts and leaders. We want to get that quickly done, but we also want to, di to do it in the right manner. Thank you. It sounds, sounds like unsure. It sounds like people who are underinsured can also qualify. That's, that seems like a new wrinkle, that if you don't have a lot of insurance, you can still get a top-up. Is that right? Well, the dental benefit that is now structured, you, you need to have basically two eligibility conditions being met. First, an income, a family income level between, below $90,000, and you don't have private insurance. You can be partly covered by a public system, as is the case for some children in Canada, but no, if, if you want to receive the benefit, it has to be that some of the dental needs, in many cases prevention uh, care, are not covered by public dental benefits. Regina, public, a question uh, for my benefits. BC colleagues, please. They're wondering, will the federal government assist BC in uh, changing regulations so that Ozempic doesn't fall into the hands of American online purchases jeopardizing supply, the diabetes free drug Ozempic? That's a great uh, issue, a very important issue on which I'm working with my, my colleague, Minister Dix. My, our teams are in contact. We'll keep being in touch because we want to make absolutely certain that in British Columbia or elsewhere in Canada, access to that drug is secured for Canadians. Thank you. Thank you. Non, il y avait des, euh, on avait émis des, des conditions aussi euh, à l'effet que les gens devaient euh, donner euh, le nom du dentiste, la date des rendez-vous des dentistes, puis que on allait faire les vérifications. Donc, euh, les vérifications sont déjà entamées euh, au sein de l'agence du revenu. Et c'est quoi les phases que vous allez euh, ouvrir on, on nous a dit hier que c'est, ça va être mis en place, mis en œuvre par phase cette année. Quelles sont ces phases Mais euh, écoutez, on avait on avait commencé avec les enfants de 12 ans mm. et moins, puis euh, comme ça a été annoncé dans le budget euh, d'ici à la fin euh, de la fin 2023, il allait y avoir d'autres clientèles, on parlait de personnes handicapées, de personnes âgées, on parlait d'étudiants et euh, de personnes qui euh, qui n'ont pas accès à des assurances euh, dentaires et qui gagnent 90 dollars et moins. Peux-tu expliquer pourquoi le coût du programme est plus, beaucoup plus haut qu'avant, prévu avant? Je ne pourrais pas vous l'expliquer actuellement. 
Est-ce que c'est vous qui allez faire une loi pour modifier la loi sur l'impôt, pour écrire dans les T4 euh, s'il y a ou non une assurance? Là? Non, l'Agence du revenu applique les lois. C'est le ministère euh, des Finances qui, euh, qui fait les lois. Je peux vous dire qu'il y a des discussions actuellement. C'est le, le ministère de la Santé qui a le leadership mmh. sur ce, sur ce dossier-là. Mais c'est votre agence qui va faire la vérification. Dans l'application, oui, et dans les vérifications. Pour recevoir des bénéfices, il faut, va falloir... Euh, oui, oui. Des reçus va, falloir sou, va falloir soumettre des reçus. Ça fait partie des conditions qui ont été mises en place là, dès le début euh, du programme. Okay. Merci. Merci. Bonne journée. Good morning. So, um, yeah, we've seen uh, some announcements around um, you know, the flood mapping and overland flood insurance uh, coming in the budget. When do, you, when do you expect people to be able to potentially sign up for that flood insurance? We've got a little bit of work to do. Um, I spoke yesterday to the uh, Insurance Bureau of Canada and some of the large insurance companies that we've been working very closely with over the past two years. Um, the, the, clearly, the budget indicates that the next step in that process is, is, is now well funded, and so we've got some work ahead of us. Um, the, with the timing, we'll work on it as quickly as possible because we do recognize helping people be better protected um, in the event of, of flood is really important in this country, and we know we've got some work to do. There's a related thing that we're also funding in that budget, and you see it's the flood mapping and the flood risk portal that we're, we're going to produce. The more information that's available to Canadians to make good decisions about where they locate and how they build, and as well the information that would be available to the insurance industry to determine the actuarial risk of, 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 of locating on a floodplain is also critically important. So all of those steps are happening concurrently and together they're going to enable us to provide that utility to, to Canadians. And with the updated flood mapping, uh, when we see uh, the insurance policies uh, be available, probably potentially not until that flood mapping is complete just because the insurance companies I imagine want to know what's the risk for this area versus I think it's going to be critically important. For, obviously, if, if insurance is going to be determined for a particular location, they have to understand risk. And, and that flood mapping, a lot of that data does exist, but, but, it's, but it's, it's not covered, it covers the, does not cover the entire country, and it's not readily available either to homeowners or to the insurance industry, and that's the work that we're doing together to make sure that that data is available. I think the most important thing is that Canadians understand risk and that they, they be able to take the steps necessary to protect themselves and their families and their properties to avoid the, or mitigate those risks as effectively as possible. Insurance is a very important part of that, and that's why we're working so closely with the insurance industry. Yeah, just one last question on my end. I'm just uh, anticipating having that portal uh, up and running by the end of the year. Well, you know what, I, I, certainly as quickly as we can, because we think it's very important, um, there's, there's some work to be done. Um, I'll be able to come back with, with some more information. We've got some additional funding now. We work very closely with NR, National Resources Canada, with, with our provincial and territorial partners. I'm going to be meeting with them in, in, in May. There, there is a strong sense of urgency on this. We'll get it done as quickly as possible, but we've, I, I will have more information and more to say about that, in the, in the, hopefully in the near future. Thank you very much. Surprise, surprise, budget question. Uh, last, uh, yesterday, uh, oh, we, we put out our budget yesterday. Of course there's a budget question. <laughs> of course, I know. I don't need to break surprises there. Uh, yesterday, Toronto, uh, Toronto's uh, deputy mayor, or I guess interim mayor, um, accused uh, Minister Freeland and the federal government of ignoring the pleas of Toronto and the big city when it comes to um, filling the hole. As you know, they've got almost nearly a billion dollar hole in the Toronto city budget that uh, for some reason they, they uh, thought that uh, the federal government would be able to fill for them. Uh, how do you respond to those comments? Has the federal government ignored the pleas of the city when it came comes to... Uh, First of all, not at all. I, I, I've been a, a member of that city administration for decades and for the last eight years, almost eight years, as a member of parliament representing a riding in Scarborough. We've worked very, very closely with mayor's office and with city council, with all of uh, our representatives municipally and provincially in that area in order to support the city of Toronto. There's been very significant investments in housing and in transit and in other types of supports that the city required. Um, we've worked very closely with them and, and we've done our best to support the, the City of Toronto and the people of Toronto uh, by making very significant investments that have truly made a difference. I understand that not everybody, and, and when, when, a, when a budget comes out, we have to be very careful. We're spending public dollars and every dollar is an investment. And, and I think very clearly in this budget, we're investing significantly in affordability, in health care, and in, in, in a new green prosperity for the country, in investments and growth. And so that's been the primary focus of our investments, and, and we want to make sure that we produce the best public value in all of those investments. We'll continue to work with the City of Toronto and with every town and city right across this country, because we know that there's still a great deal of work to do. But, but you know, I, I, frankly, I don't accept 
the concern that was expressed that we haven't been there for the city because we've been there for the city in transit, in housing, and in countless other investments for the past several years. Now, on the heels of two, uh, two large uh, payouts from the, uh, from the federal government to the city when it comes to the COVID-19 response, was it unrealistic for the, for the uh, Toronto government to, or Toronto City Council to expect that the government would be there again with another big uh, payout? I, listen, I understand that the, the City of Toronto has some challenges with respect to um, th their budget as a, as a direct consequence of, of, of what occurred during the pandemic. Municipalities right across the country, provinces and territories across the country have experienced similar challenges. But we made a great deal of money available through the provinces and territories to assist those municipalities. And, and I think it's important that we continue to work together to, to respond to those concerns. Ultimately, there's only one taxpayer and we have to be there for that. Thanks so much. Okay. Uh, in fact, my primary concern is for the families of the victims of the tragedy in, in Truro uh, and Porta Pic. Um, we expect the report to be released very shortly. Um, our thoughts are with them. Uh, I've had a chance to grieve directly with, with some of those families, and um, no doubt the publication of this report are going to bring a lot of those emotions coming back. They're still very much grief-stricken uh, by the loss uh, of, of their family and their, and their relatives. And I was actually just recently in Nova Scotia, and I know that it is still very much um, um, a difficult time for them. So the release of the report will, will bring that Minister, back. We'll be, there, we'll be there to support them. Do you anticipate that this report is going to play into your selection for the next head of the RCMP? Well, first, uh, with uh, our uh, Commissioner Mike Duhem, uh, he and I have already have had a, an important discussion about fulfilling the commitments uh, that are in the mandate letter, which I issued to his predecessor, uh, Brenda Lucky, but one in which he and the RCMP remain fully committed uh, to working with the government to see realized so that we can maintain the confidence of Canadians in the RCMP as an institution. Uh, it plays an incredibly important role in providing public safety across the country, including in uh, rural communities like Port of Pick and Truro and I do think that the report uh, will, that will come tomorrow will touch on a number of issues that overlap um, with the mandate, but our primary concern tomorrow is for the families of the victims. And to Minister, be you're, 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 you say you're grieving with the families. You're responsible for the police force that abjectly failed to notify the public in any sense of the dangers they were facing. So can you speak to your own accountability and to the police force's accountability ahead of this report? I, I hear you saying you're grieving with them. I think they would have preferred accountability and proper policing that would not have led to this. Well, I think they want both, to be clear, uh, which is to say they want support, they need support, they deserve support, and they will get support. But you're right that there are uh, likely going to be a number of issues that the report will touch on uh, where uh, there needs to be accountability. Uh, including on reporting and alerting and making sure that there's appropriate coverage. Um, and we have to embrace that uh, because there are lessons to be taken uh, from that report. And I would say that between Port of Pic and Truro and, for example, in James Smith Green Nation, that the RCMP did do a better job of alerting the community uh, when it came to uh, um, an issue around uh, a violence and serious threat to the community. Uh, but it doesn't end there. So we're going to receive the report. Um, we're going to do uh, what, what is necessary to reflect on the merits of the report and then implement those lessons. What is but accountability? Our, you said our, there should be accountability. What, what does accountability look like? Well, first, I think acknowledging uh, where there needs to be uh, more work in our response uh, to issues that involve serious threats of violence, including on firearms, uh, making sure that there's a rapid deployment of law enforcement, making sure that there's appropriate communication. It means acknowledging that up front and then taking those lessons and implementing uh, the recommendations of the report. But I want to reiterate that our number one concern tomorrow will be to support the families. Minister, you're you three officers right now. I'm very keen, I'm very keen to yes. answer your questions. Yes. I can only right. answer them one time. Let me ask this. Minister, you currently have three officers on the ground right now, RCMP officers in the OPC. What is the nature of their role right now? With regards to, sorry, They're where? They're in northeast Syria. They arrived at Al Raj camp. Well, I, I, look, I don't uh, talk about ongoing operations uh, that may be carried out by the RCMP. If, if uh, you're referring to a, a particular operation, I would, I would direct it's you to It's in regards that. to interviewing uh, Canadian detainees in northeast Syria? Are so they again, doing a security I, check? Look, I would, I would uh, direct you to the RCMP for operational details. I don't uh, give those details out. Prime Minister, how come you don't want to? There you go. Last question, please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
On foreign interference, what are we to make of the fact that there's no money in the budget for the work of David Johnston or for a potential inquiry down the road? Where will that come from? I think you misinterpret uh, what's in the budget. There is money uh, to combat for... wouldn't be the for... first time. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so, there is money in the budget to combat foreign interference. Uh, there's money to create a national coordinator office to combat foreign interference. There's money in the budget uh, to support the work of the RCMP, which in turn will support diasporas who may be targeted uh, by foreign interference. And there's also money in the budget uh, for ceases to combat um, uh, threats to national security. So in fact, there are some very substantive commitments. Right, but, but, but on, that, on, that, on the point that the government has appointed David Johnston, who's going to be doing two months' worth of work and beyond, and then possibly a public inquiry. What are we to make of the fact that there is nothing booked for that? Mr. Johnston, who is an eminently qualified Canadian, uh, best possible choice in the, in the view of the government to uh, look into the next practical steps to fight foreign interference, will get all of the support that he needs to carry out his work transparently, to provide recommendations which the government will respect, including and up to a public inquiry. And in the meantime, the investments which are in the budget are there to protect our institutions from foreign interference. And what are Thanks the financial much. tools? You said there's a, there's a provision in the budget for yeah. revised financial tools to police foreign interference. What does that mean? What is that? It does means that providing like? police with the tools and the resources that they need to support communities uh, who may be targeted for institutions. Well, there's also some money in the budget, as, uh, as, you, as you will have read, uh, for uh, the creation of the Canada Financial Crimes Agency, uh, for FinTrack, and for the RCMP. There'll be more details about what those options are. Uh, Thanks very speaker, much. Anti-scab legislation for federally regulated sectors. Yeah. Um, first of all, timeline. And what do you expect the impact of that will be? Uh, I mean, I guess there are American concerns about how we deal with union rules and stuff, too. So can you talk a bit about that? Oh, shoot. You got it? No, I'm not. <laughs> you got it? Okay. So, uh, you know, we agreed to buy, introduce legislation by the end of the year. We'll, we'll definitely be doing that. Um, it's a matter of, you know, you want people focused on the table. That was the whole idea behind uh, replacement worker legislation. You want people focused on the table. Um, and you want people negotiating. So, you know, in a, in a G7 country where you've got an economy to run and you want to make sure supply chains aren't interrupted, how do you make sure you focus on the table and minimize work stoppages, right? That's, that's the thing. So we're trying to learn from other jurisdictions that have brought it in. Quebec's had it for quite some time, so it was BC. Uh, so we're going through that, trying to figure out, and we're talking to both sides. We, the consultations we had, we had them together. It was two days. I sat in them. Um, we had even the, the placement of seats, you know. We, we didn't have unions on one side and employers on the other. Everybody sat around, interspersed, and it was messy. It was messy. You know, how are we going to get through this together? But everybody's committed to doing it. And, uh, you know, I'll take all, all good ideas on how we maintain the stability of supply chains, but at the same time keeping a word and uh, getting rid of replacement workers. What's your timeline for bringing that bill in? By the end of the year. So it's not part of the Budget Implementation Act. It's going to be a separate standalone piece of legislation. That's right. That's right. And so by the end of the calendar year? Yes. Or not the sitting? No, by the, okay. end, of the, by the end of the year. With potentially coming, looking at passing a bill next year. Yeah, yeah, so that would be the idea. But introduced, introduced in the House by the end of the year. Yeah. 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 Do you have concerns that it will uh, create irritants with the U.S.? Well, I want to minimize, and one thing I learned very early on, you know, you're handling a CP rail strike and suddenly you're getting calls from the White House and texts mm -hmm. from the U.S. ambassador in the middle of the night and Marty Walsh, the Secretary of Labor, is calling you and it, you, it occurs to you, yeah, we're, you know, we are intimately, intricately linked. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yeah, you, you want to get it right. That's for sure. Not just for Canada. I mean, obviously, anything that affects the United States and our trade affects us. But, yeah, you know, I want to get it right. And I'm, you know, I'm convinced there's a lot of big minds around this. It's been done in other jurisdictions. I think we can come up with a model to make sure that we maintain services and supply chains and at the same time respect the negotiated debt. Okay? Merci. Thank you.